Okay. Als nächstes haben wir, glaube ich, drei ganz besondere Gäste auf der Bühne, ähm, auf die ich mich sehr, sehr gefreut habe und auch jetzt auf der Bühne freue. Ähm, Sie haben zwar nicht die weiteste Anreise, das hat noch mal jemand getoppt, aber trotzdem, ich sag mal, aus Amerika angereist und ähm, das ist, glaube ich, schon mal aller Ehren wert. Ähm, ich denke, die meisten kennen Sie. Wir haben jetzt auf der Bühne den Dave Haney, den Jeff Porter und den Ron Nicholson. Um, come on stage, guys. Yeah. Um, we bring uh, three chairs, yeah? So, wir bauen noch mal ganz kurz ein bisschen um. Und ähm, besorgen noch kurz drei Stühle, damit die drei auch in Ruhe hier ein bisschen was erzählen können. Und gerne, wenn gewünscht, auch Fragen aus dem Publikum entgegennehmen. So, I, um, I told them if they have any questions, they can um, ask them from the audience later. Okay, yeah? that sounds so, good. Um, so, that's, you, that's perfect. So, I think Dave's going to start and then we'll go this way. Okay, that's fine. Um, shall we wait for the stairs, uh, chairs? <laughs> yeah, we can wait for chairs. Okay. Do we need a beer for this? I have beer. You can always right. bring more. <laughs> People keep handing them beer faster than I can so it's not. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is a pretty good turnout. Um, I'm your old buddy Dave. I was here two years ago, and I've been around. And um, but uh, we managed to get a few others here this year um, to discuss various things, particularly uh, salient after uh, 30 years of the Amiga 500. Um, but I guess first up will be Ron Nicholson. Now, some of you have seen a few of the computers I designed, but you know the custom chips was the magic inside of that, and chip designers are those magicians that do the stuff that I'm not quite sure what's going on there myself. I just get the 48 or 84 pin packages and hook them all together and make a computer out of it. But um, And so Ron's going to talk a little bit about the very, very early days of Amiga, which I was in college when that was happening. <laughs> And then Jeff Porter's going to get up and talk a little bit about um, how you guys got the Amiga. Jeff was uh, instrumental in that. He's also the best guy I ever worked for. And so uh, without further ado, um, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back and answer, ask, answer some questions and stuff, but I'll hand it over to Ron. Thank you, Dave, for that very kind introduction. So after 30 years of not knowing what was happening to the Amiga in Europe, I came back here two years ago to find out, and I'm back again. So to tell a little bit of the story, uh, over 35 years ago, Dave Morse wrote the original business plan to do a game machine. A few months later, Jay Miner, Joe DeCure and myself got together in a room to draw up some ideas for what we thought was just going to be a low-cost video game. We put together some interesting ideas that turned out to have some pretty lasting values. So just to summarize, I came from a mini computer, big mini computer company, and I had also worked on the uh, Macintosh at Apple. Jay Miner and Joe DeCure had done the Atari VCS video game chips, and Jay was doing a pacemaker, small chips, and he wanted to do a big workstation class computer. I wanted to do a color video game, and I think the combination of us working on different ideas resulted 
in what some of the things that were very interesting about the Amiga. I'll just go through a few of the ideas we decided to put together and integrate into a low enough cost chipset that we could sell it to consumers. Uh, some of the ideas that we put together were uh, doing frame synchronous video so you could do animation without tearing. We decided to put more colors in the chip. Now, not enough to do realistic images, but enough that an artist could make nice looking images. It was just enough color to make the design of games an art form rather than just uh, a few pixels. We also, uh, I lost my thing, put in enough uh, power in the chipset to animate the images to do more cartoon class things, both with a bit blitter and with some sprites. On top of that, uh, both Jody Kerr and I wanted to do better sound. And, it, you know, the sound isn't 16 bit audiophile quality, but again, it was enough that an audio artist, a musician, could make interesting sounding music more than beeps and boops. Uh, we added uh, ideas from mini computers, DMA, to do uh, more powerful, uh, you know, computer processing and a 68,000 processor. Now we threw those all together, and little did we know that that combination was enough to provide the critical mass to do multimedia and to do desktop video. And I think those ideas alone would have carried the, the chip forward, the, the design of the Amiga computer forward, and uh, we had some hard times. Back then we did not have a lot of computer design tools, so we had to do a lot of hand wiring and hand drawing of the schematics, the logic, and the chip designs. And given the size of the chips, uh, you know, I look back on that, and it was a pretty much a miracle that the thing all pretty much worked the first time. So we got it working, and uh, through the sale of uh, Amiga to Commodore, and uh, they were able to manufacture the product, and they started marketing it in the U.S. as a business computer. So I, I thought, you know, all this stuff I had done to make it a good video game, you know, and multimedia was wasted. In California, the Amiga did not sell well at all. There were no stories that carried Amiga software. So it's pretty much when Commodore decided to take the Amiga to another market that they brought it to you and made the product enough of a success that it could develop uh, it, the other creative markets. So I'll pass it off to Jeff to talk about how that happened. Great. How's everybody doing today? Awesome. Uh, so my name is Jeff Porter. Uh, I was uh, head of the R&D group at Commodore in Westchester, uh, Pennsylvania. And I still live there today. Uh, but today is, is pretty special for me. I don't usually show up at, I'm usually not a roadie with Dave going to these events. Um, so, but when Marcus told me that this was the 30th anniversary of the Amiga 500, and the Amiga 500 was pretty much my baby, I said, I think I better show up for that day. So, here I am. And thank you, Marcus, for inviting me, wherever you are. And uh, thank you to all the sponsors. Thank you. And by the way, your daughter is absolutely adorable with that pink Amiga shirt. I'm like, that's my favorite picture of the whole, the whole show. Uh, anyways, so a little bit about me. I'm still based in uh, the Philadelphia area. Uh, I'm a me, myself, and I consulting firm for people doing digital signage networks. Uh, so you may have heard that uh, I worked for Scala for a few years. Uh, Scala got its start in Norway on a little chicken farm in Brimendal, Norway, back in 1987. And, uh, you know, as Commodore was going this way, Digital signage was going that way, and so I uh, went to join them for about 18 years. I pretty much did every job there at Scala. I was head of R&D, I was head of sales and marketing, I was executive vice president, I was president and CEO, I was chief cook and bottle washer, and I was the phone guy. Because in a former life, I used to work for Bell Labs, so I was the only guy that knew how to program the PBX. 
So, uh, uh, and uh, so I just want to share some, a few stories about my time at Commodore and, and what I did. And uh, really, the, when I, I started with Commodore in 1984. And uh, I must have been only two years old because I can't be that old today. So it's uh, 1984, and I came there, and they said, well, we've got uh, you know, three things we can work on. We can either work on the C64, we can work on Unix workstations, or we can work on a laptop computer. 1984, laptops? That sounds awesome. Yeah, we got this LCD factory. Hello, darling. We got this uh, absolutely killer LCD factory here, and we're going to make a laptop computer. All right, sign me up. So the first week I showed up, I came in my Bell Labs tie, and I looked completely out of place because uh, all the other engineers looked like Dave. <laughs> and it's like, all right. And they said, oh, you're from Bell Labs. Oh, you need to, you need to do a modem. We have this modem. It's really screwed up. I said, OK, I'll do a modem. OK, do I get to work on the laptop next week? Because I really want to work on this laptop. So anyways, I, I had a fun time doing the laptop. And we, uh, we made a, uh, a bunch of those prototypes. And uh, one of these days, I'll, I'll bring that to a show, and you can see it. But it's uh, really the trick was uh, the next generation, Dave was working on something called the 128 that some of you probably had. And the next generation was the Amiga. And the Amiga was this amazing revolutionary technology. But, you know, and I was actually did a modem for the Amiga. OK, that was another job I had. And uh, we spent about $55 million bringing the first Amiga to market. It was a lot of money. And after about the first year, we sold about 77,000 units. So you can pretty much do the math on that. It was an NTSC-only computer, so we could only sell it in the US, right? So someone had the brilliant idea. Let's make a PAL version. Hey, that's a really good idea. So, oh, we need somebody to do that. Uh, Jeff, forget that LCD computer, that laptop. No, 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 no. We need you to do this PAL Amiga. So I said, what the hell? I'm here at Commodore. I'm here to have fun. Let's go do some PAL Amigas. And uh, so I got to go visit all the chip designers in California. And I said, all right. so. 525 scan lines? No. 625 scan lines. 60 hertz? No. 50 hertz. And they looked at me and said, crap, we need a new Agnes chip. All right, well, let's get busy. And then, there, of course, you had to have new software to go with the new Agnes chip, and you had to have a 220-volt power supply, and you had to have a keyboard with all these funny characters on it that you guys need. I don't know what the hell is wrong with ASCII, you know? Umlauts, what the hell are those? Actually, I know what umlauts are. So uh, so I had a pretty good time. I, I got to meet everybody in California. I already knew all the guys in Pennsylvania. I got to meet all the factory guys in the Far East and all the vendors like Philips that were making the monitors for us. And we had to have PAL monitors to go with the PAL computers and the power supply guys and the folks at Matsuyama, Japan, that were building the, uh, the first uh, A1000 computers. And then I got to meet all the guys in Europe that were the sales and marketing guys for Commodore Europe, and David Pleasance, and uh, Winfried Hoffman, and Helmut Yost, and all the amazing guys here that, man, they could like sell computers. Holy crap. So. It was, uh, I think, 1986 that we had the launch of the PAL A1000 at the Alt Opera House in Frankfurt. Was anybody here for that one? Except me? OK. It was a pretty cool event. It was this big opera house in Frankfurt, and, and it was a major announcement. And uh, But that. 
the A1000 was kind of like this straddling two markets with one product. How do you do it? We, you know, it was kind of too expensive for most people to buy and yet wasn't having enough expansion slots for people to plug cards in. So somebody had the brilliant idea. <laughs> Let's turn this into a Commodore 64. I bet I can redu cost reduce this, the crap out of this thing. And so I said, let's build in the keyboard, let's take the power supply out, let's make it a brick, we'll have it all in one unit, we'll put it in a nice plastic case, and the guys in California thought I was the devil. Maybe not this guy, okay. But they thought, oh, you are putting the diapers on my baby completely backwards. What are you doing to the Amiga? Oh my God, you're ruining it, oy vey. I said, no, 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 no. We're gonna sell millions of these, trust me, all right? So we did some amazing things to get the cost down. I looked at the custom chips and I said, we gotta integrate that, that's where Fat Agnes came from. We gotta put them in plastic packages so they're cheap. We gotta get the yields up on the silicon. We gotta put the PC board on a two-layer board instead of a four-layer board and we're building it in the same factory in Hong Kong that makes cheap Commodore 64s. And we're using a, uh, a ROM chip for the kickstart, so there's no RAM kickstart disk anymore. And that, uh, believe it or not, that giant 16-bit ROM was the same kind of ROM that they were using in Nintendo game cartridges. So it was really cheap. So all of a sudden, we just like were throwing we were cost reducing the crap out of this like you wouldn't believe. And uh, I don't know that I've ever admitted this in public, but we got the cost of the A500 down to uh, $200. So we could sell it for 400 to the retail channel and then mark it up to the end user to like 600 and everybody was really happy. And in fact, somebody asked me today, why do we call it the Amiga 500? I said that because that's what it was supposed to sell for. <laughs> it's supposed to sell for 500 bucks. If you can make a computer for 500 bucks versus a computer for 600 bucks, you'll sell twice as many at 500 than at 600. There's just some magic price points in the world. And every time you take another 100 bucks out, you double the volume. So it's pretty amazing there that if you can get the right price points, you can move a whole bunch of these things. So we did that, and uh, you know, in January of 1987, we had the first Amiga 500 prototypes in plastic cases. I think our tooling had just come in. And uh, I still remember Winfried Hoffman coming in from Germany, and he looked at that. It was running Defender of the Crown, it was running Deluxe Paint, it was running all these famous Amiga titles, and it looked like a Commodore 64, and his eyes just like lit up. I said, Jeff, I know exactly what to do with this, and by the way, I'm taking that one. It's going with me. I'm, yeah, I'm hand carrying it back to Germany. <laughs> there is no way this one is going back to Pennsylvania. Sorry. <laughs> I said, please. And by the way, I have another one here. Do you want two? <laughs> yes, please, okay. And I have a third one from the guy from the UK. Great. So it was an amazing time because all the groundwork that was laid from J Minor and the original guys and to get that together with the amazing manufacturing and cost reduction capability of Commodore got a product here for you. And 30 years later, it's a pretty special day for me. I mean, 30 years? Look at how many people are here. This is, what the hell? This is crazy. This is crazy amazing. So, number one, thank you for being part of my journey. Because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really an incredible story. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I want to talk about? Uh, so somebody said, how come, asked me, why didn't we have 
much success with the Amiga in the United States? Yeah? Pretty typical question. And there's a pretty easy answer for that, actually. So they hired a bunch of ex-Apple guys. And I don't know if you've seen the, the movie, the uh, Amiga years that we saw last night, but there was a marketing guy by the name of Frank Leonardi who was uh, a marketing guy at Apple during the Macintosh years. And I still remember that little chat, that little fireside chat that Frank had with me with the Amiga 500. And he said, Jeff, I had the same chat with Steve. We're not putting the Mac in Toys R Us. We're going to put it in the proper computer stores and we'll be fine. And, you know, Jeff, I was right. Steve's pretty rich and famous. You could be rich and famous too. I said, Frank, it's a game machine. Really? This needs to be in Toys R Us. This needs to be selling in volume. So that's pretty much the answer. And in fact, he admitted on the video that he, he didn't have a clue about marketing. And I, I said to the guy sitting next to me last night, I was watching this movie again, dude, you're the vice president of marketing. And you're saying you didn't have a clue about marketing. Okay. So the U.S., it, it, during the heyday, when you guys were eating up Amiga 500s like popcorn, the U.S. sold only 10% of what you guys were doing here. 90% of Commodore's volume of Amigas was sold in Europe. Much thanks to Germany and the U.K., and some of the wacky guys in Scandinavia, who I love. They're totally wacky, cool guys. Just don't go there in the winter because it's really boring. It's dark, it's cold, it's terrible. But in the summer, they party like it's never before. Uh, okay, so that's the story of what happened in uh, uh, the US. Uh, there, one other story that's kind of like cool Another product that I was involved with was uh, CDTV, which was an Amiga. It just happened to be a black Amiga that was in like a stereo cabinet. Um, you know, we had an amazing ability. You know, we didn't have a whole lot of marketing or MBA types or product manager types. We had guys that knew how to manufacture stuff cheap. We had sales guys. We had bean counters. And we had engineers. <laughs> so the engineering department had to figure out what to make, make it, convince the factory to build it for cheap and sell it to the sales guys so that they go sell a million of them. So, you know, that's not normal today. Fortunately, we were a billion dollar garage shop and they let us do that because we were kind of building computers that we wanted for ourselves, right? So it was, it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. The, uh, my little shirt here is the B-52 Bombers. Uh, the code name for the Amiga 500 was the B-52. And it kind of worked on a couple different levels. The young guys thought, oh, that's a cool group. I love their music. And so the guy laying out the board said, oh, I'm putting Rock Lobster on the, on the PC board. So it's like, and the old guys of the company looked and uh, Rock Lobster? What the hell is that? What's the B-52s? It's okay. It's, it's music. Oh, okay. Great. So the old guys thought B-52s, they thought of World War II bombers, right? And their attitude was, if we don't get this right, you might as well bring in the bombers and level the place and close the doors. Because, <laughs> you know, we don't have that many chances. Fortunately, we had an amazing team, and we built the Amiga 500, and... As they say, the rest is history. The uh, one other cool story is about the CDTV. And uh, one of the things I'm kind of proud of, besides the Amiga, is that, as you rec some of you may recall, the CDTV, when it first came out, was pretty expensive. Sound familiar? Like an A1200? Built in Japan, yeah, like an A1200. Guys, come on. 
we've already done an Amiga 500. Haven't we learned some lessons from that? So I got called to the big guy's office in New York City. I said, Jeff, we need to cost reduce the CDTV. I said, okay. They were paying $400 just for the CD-ROM drive in this thing. It's like, holy crap, that's a lot of money. So I went to Japan, I talked to Sony, and I said, guys, you invented the CD-ROM. I'm guessing you have a cheap one somewhere. And they said, well, here's all the CD-ROMs that we have, blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, 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 none of that. I want the one that has the nice little motorized drawer that you push the button and the CD comes out. Oh, that's in our audio product line. I said, okay, show me the audio product line. Ooh, that one looks good. I'm gonna, that's, that's the one I want. Oh, well, that's not for data. I said, dude, it's a CD. It's, there's data on it already. We can use that. Uh, everybody like gave me the, uh, I said, watch me, watch me. So I went to uh, a, a factory in Japan that had built all our floppy drives. And I said, I need a little help. You guys speak Japan, Japanese, I don't. Work with Sony, suck their brains dry. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna make an IDE interface for a CD-ROM drive. No one had ever done that before. With an audio mechanism and a double speed, woohoo, CD-ROM drive with predictive uh, track seeking and all this other kind of stuff. So we had some pretty cool software and firmware to make the CD-ROM drive work. And uh, $15 went from 400 to 15. Unfortunately, by the time that the cost reduced CDTV got around, Commodore had kind of screwed up with the Christmas inventories and building things, and it was kind of like going like that. So, but it was an interesting story. So when you look at the lovely cheap-ass CD-ROMs on your PC and Amigas today, you can think of me again. All right. Let's... Let's open it up for a few questions. Uh, I'll give the mic to Dave since he's like the MC with the most this here. Questions? No? Yes? Yes. So, who has questions? Wer hat Fragen? Don't be shy. Um, if the A500 was uh, wrongly marketed in the USA, what about the A2000? Because that was more like a business machine like... A2000 is Dave's machine more than my machine, but I would say from a marketing perspective, the... It, uh, the software community didn't embrace it on the... the the A2000 did really well for things like the video toaster in the US, right? So if you were into video, it was great for that. But did you go to a Macintosh store for a video toaster? No. But did they have video toaster stores? Not really. So, yeah. Yeah, um, and actually that's kind of, that, there's a little interesting story there. It's a fairly quick one. Um, this sort of reflects that the way Commodore worked, so the A2000 idea came from Germany, from, from our engineering team in Braunschweig, but they were using all the A1000 parts and a lot of extra PALs and stuff from the example expansion device, and they had put in a slot for extra memory in there that was essentially the edge of the A1000, and they had put in a slot for a Genlock that was essentially the same as the 23-pin connector, and I was, I, I looked at the slot and said, no, that's the CPU slot. I want to put extra CPUs in here because I want to be able to expand this and make it go faster, because that's the one thing you couldn't do with the regular Zorro card, and I was all about the expansion bus at the time, but then I, I sat down one afternoon talking to George Robbins, so um, the reason I was doing Amiga stuff was that I had been the number two guy in the Commodore 128, and Bill Hurd left, and that left me as like the chief honcho of the 128 and the 8-bit technology at the system level. And I came up with a couple ideas, and nobody really wanted to do another 8-bit machine. And I didn't really want to do another 8-bit machine, but that was kind of my... That, 
yeah, that was kind of that was kind of my uh, that was my jam at that point. So um, George was having more work than he needed on the on the uh, 500. So um, I was invited to help out on the 500 for about a month, and then we got the the 2000 project. And I think uh, originally they were going to give that to George because he had done the Commodore 900. He was a high end guy, but like like as with Jeff, the A500 was his baby. And I had very little skin in the game. I had already learned the A500 chip, so they gave it to me, like this junior guy, like, okay, um, you go do the 2000. And so I was sitting around with George one day, and we, we I, as I did every time I had a question about the A500 chips, and I said, this, this Genlock slot's kind of stupid. I want to put another extension on here to bring out the full digital video bus. And this was just something that I thought of, and it's like, well, I can probably just do that, and if, if anyone complains, we'll argue about it later. And then uh, George said, hey, why don't you bring the parallel port over? And uh, those two things made the uh, video toaster possible, and that's responsible for almost all the A2000s that were sold in the United States. And that had absolutely nothing to do with marketing from us. It was new text marketing that sold A2000s. So that was my take on the, uh, on the marketing question for the A2000. Uh, by a roundabout way. Um, <laughs> yes, Let, let's say um, uh, you have to design a new computer machine today. Um, what would you do? Um, would you do some kind of new custom chips or do you use uh, um, actual technology and do everything in software and so on? I don't know what I'd do today. There's so many opportunities that the advances in technology from Moore's Law has done. From when I started out, it was a few thousand transistors were good, and now the, they're putting billions of transistors in the smartphone. They're putting in accelerators for machine learning to, uh, you know, do voice and image recognition and graphics and multiple processors so that no one processor has to get too busy. There are just so many opportunities for a creative engineer, perhaps you, perhaps one of your kids, to go to school and say, using billions of transistors, it would be easy to do and then do something that would again change our world. And I think that's the opportunity. I think the thing that's changed now is that the silicon area is free. You're not limited by the size of the die. In the old days, when the chip designers were designing silicon, they did all sorts of fancy tricks to save on the size of the die so that they could get their feature functionality and the cost that they needed. We had to throw features out of the Amiga 1000 to save one pin. That was the cost of the design constraints back then. Those constraints no longer exist. There's so many more freedoms that an engineer has to do cool things. So pins are no longer the limit. Silicon area and transistor count is no longer the limit. It's, it's really a game changer in terms of that. So it's really the software that drives the design of the silicon way more and your ideas. So your mind is a limiting factor, not the technology. One interesting little story. When we did the first Fat Agnes chip for the Amiga 500, you know, the original three custom chips were in, I think, 48 pin dips. Yeah? So they looked like little Hershey bars with pins on each side. So when we did Fat Agnes, we went to a PLCC, which was a square package that had pins on all four sides with 84 pins. Woohoo! 84 pins. Um, I made the mistake of not knowing where a pin one was. I thought it was on the corner. And we laid out the PC board to go one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 84. No, the pin one is in the middle of the top. 
I said, shit, I already have the board laid out. I need to drop in the chip. So uh, fortunately, the fab, the silicon, silicon foundry for Commodore was in Pennsylvania, right up the road. So I told them, I said, can you make me an 84 pin where the die is rotated 45 degrees and you connect the little wire bonds like this and like some of the corners got really long, but it worked. We got the first prototype of the Fat Agnes working with the 45 degree rotated uh, pin. Oh my God, how embarrassing that was. So that's a, that's a nice little trivia question. Next question. Hi, um, who designs the cases of the Amiga models and have you been involved in the process of designing them? The, uh, the Amiga 500 case was designed by a little guy in Japan by the name of Ito, Ito-san. He was my favorite industrial designer, oh my god. He used to design all this fancy Japanese stereo equipment, you know, that was very high-end, you know, Bang & Olufsen kind of looking stuff. And he was just an artist, actually. So an industrial designer artist, he would, you know, I would go to him and I said, Ido-san, I need, I need a, a casework design for my next computer. And I said, I, I, have to, I need a PC board that's this big and a floppy drive and a keyboard and I gotta have ports out the back and whatever. And, and I'd give him some rough dimensional things and he'd come back with three or four pictures of what the case would look like. Oh my God, these were works of art. These hand-drawn charcoal pictures were works of art. And as soon as I saw that Amiga 500 with the giant Amiga thing built into the plastic right in the front, I said, ooh, that's the one, that's the one. So, uh, when we went to the 1200 and 4000, we used a different industrial design designer for that. Don, I've forgotten Don's. No, Herb was the mechanical engineer. He didn't do the, uh, there was another guy that did the kind of like the blocky thing. We actually had a prototype at one time from Frog Design, which was an Apple thing. That was when Apple was in vogue at Commodore. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Okay, how many people have heard of the name Philippe Stark? All right, famous French designer, dude. Yeah? The A3000 almost got an industrial design from Philippe Stark. So I'm thinking, okay, I've worked with Ido-san for a while. I know how to interface with an industrial designer. Okay, I've got a power supply, I've got a floppy drive, I've got a hard drive, I've got a motherboard, blah, blah, blah. Here's your basic shape and size requirements of the box that I need. Give me the bezel design, give me the case design, blah, blah, blah. How hard can this be? Oh my God. French people. Okay, so. I had a monitor that had Mickey Mouse ears on it for speakers that was shaped like an egg. The monitor was, the whole housing was shaped like an egg with Mickey Mouse ears on it. I couldn't even, I couldn't make a plastic injection mold that would do that. I said, I don't even know how to manufacture this. And then, he was like, the piece of the cake was, he wanted to reorganize the keys on the keyboard. I said, no. Okay, you did that in France, goddammit. You can't do that to, to the rest of the world. You know, if you have Azerte in France, that's fine. But we need QWERTY in the rest of the world. So we went back and forth a few times with Philippe Stark. And by the time we were done, we said, okay, well, well, I've got Ito, he'll make me a nice bezel. <laughs> and so that's what we did. Interesting, thank you for that question. Any other? Any question? 
The Germans did that one. The Germans did the 2000 bezel. I, there was a wham bam. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Flat in the front, little groove, logo. Done. Hold it up. Looked like a PC 10. Hi. Hi. Um, this is not a real question, but um, you know, we Germans, we love the Amiga 500 and uh, we love it so much. Um, we redesigned it last year, we made new boards, made them available as do-it-yourself kit. And, wow, um, sold, incredibly. Yeah, and sold over 200 uh, pieces you worldwide. Can't see um, and when we heard that you came to Germany, um, we came up with the idea that uh, you should get one. Oh, <laughs> this is for you. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Look at that. There's a story, you're out of parts, yeah, so I have to stuff it myself. Yeah, you have to get the parts by yourself or hang it on the wall. I'm, <laughs> I'm good with that because, okay, here's another story. Uh, before we had surface mount, you know, things, when we got a new PC board in at, at Commodore, all the engineers would say, okay, it's a stuffing party. Okay, which means... All the engineers, they got one of the blank prototype PC boards, they sat down at the workbench, and everyone stuffed their own motherboard. And the first guy to get their computer to boot wins. <laughs> it took me five evenings, evenings to uh, stuff yeah. the board. <laughs> yeah. No, that's amazing. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah, you're welcome. Your first ROHS 500. <laughs> wow. I didn't expect that at all, but thank you so much. Other uh, questions? Um, I have a question um, about the uh, custom ships. Uh, um, the, the graphics were better each generation, but uh, the Paula States the same. Uh, why? Um, why, the, why? Can you the repeat the question, uh, Dave? The question was um, that for each major generation of Amiga chips, the graphics got better, but the polis stayed the same. Why is that? Because <laughs> everybody wanted better graphics and the sound was good enough? Yeah, yeah, that's that sounds pretty reasonable. There was there was a big effort in the AAA project, which of course never did see the light of day, other than my three prototype boards, um, to improve the sound there. That was 16-bit audio with eight channels and uh, left-right control. Um, but I mean, part of it was also that I think that you know was, there was there was a squeaky wheel, and that was graphics. And everybody wants better graphics. We everybody all, and wants and better we, graphics. For, for the double A project, the Pandora project, the AGA project, if you must, um, we were limited to doing one chip for real, one brand new chip, which was the Lisa chip. Um, the Alice chip was was a slightly even fatter Agnes when it really came down to it. In fact, it, I think it was the biggest NMOS chip Commodore ever made. Um, they were a little concerned that it wouldn't work, but it did. Um, and that was kind of next in line for being revised because part of it was that unless, except for when you did tricks like they did in, in uh, Andrea, I mean, in, not Andrea, that's Triple H, in, in Alice to run a, uh, a, a, a wider bus with double clock cycles for video fetch, which meant a bigger package and all that for the video chip, um, you, couldn't, you didn't have the DMA slots to do much new with audio. So they would have had to make more changes in Alice before they could make changes and make a, you know, a bigger Paula. Um, so I think it was that the, the way the graphics were done, they made the fewest tweaks possible without starting all over with a new chip. They wanted to. We actually had sort of kind of a project going called AA Plus, 
<laughs> which um, the idea was <clears throat> to uh, put a uh, the, to put a uh, a larger um, to put a larger um, chip. Well, a larger chip. The uh, the Atlas chip was going to be redone in CMOS. It was going to have fast. It could run at full speed. It might. It, it, there might have been a 32-bit version of it, but initially it was just going to be 16 bits. It would. We actually had that jumper on the 4000, that that two megabyte, eight megabyte jumper. That that was that was the idea behind that. Um, it was never actually an approved project. It was just something that we had sort of specked out and were thinking about and hoping that maybe we could get some interest in. And that was mostly driven from the low end. George Robbins didn't want to abandon Amiga low end, and it was looking every day like the AAA system, if it was ever finished, was going to be too expensive for low end chips because you needed at least four 144 pin packages and other stuff. So that was, you know, the, the idea was that we wanted to keep evolving this system, um, but that's, the, the problem was those were, that was all happening in like after 1991 when things were really starting to go south with Commodore. So we had a lot of really good ideas that just never really went anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Joe DeCure was an audio engineer and he had lots of ideas of what he wanted to do next in audio. Some of them may be in his notebooks. My notebooks were long lost, but I had done prior computers with a lot more serial I.O capability and more interesting forms of disk I.O. But at the time Commodore did the chip revisions, no one bothered to talk to Joe DeCure or myself. Okay, maybe I know we're running really late and I hope I apologize to the next group that was already supposed to be doing something here, but maybe we have one more question. I was just wondering, Jeff, those uh, artworks that you talked about from the designer in Japan, do they still exist? Yes, I have them. Can they in some way be made public to the world? Uh, yeah, they look a lot like the computer you have. But yeah, but, I should, but that was I should digitize those pieces draw, of art. In, uh, they're, they're very special. They're incredibly special. I might even have some of the ones that we didn't pick. <laughs> and I, the other, I have a, giant poster of the cover of Byte magazine, which is a big computer magazine in, in, in the U.S. at the time. It, it's no longer published, but when we launched the Amiga 3000, it was a pretty big deal to get the cover of Byte magazine. So, you know, thank you, Jeff. We got the cover of Byte magazine. All right. Any, uh, anything else? And we'll wrap it up. Uh, uh. So, um... I, that's about it, because there's other people who want to do their thing. Um, I think we're, uh, we're appearing here all day, <laughs> and I would be happy to answer more questions in smaller groups or whatever. And um, I thank you, and uh, Marcus, I don't see him, but I, uh, you know, I, uh, for inviting us here again, and uh, it's, this is great. It's so different to it's a little bit like back in the past to come back and see a, a really crowded Amiga show. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming and for uh, putting up with all our BS for a couple minutes. And uh... Ha, 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 ha.